back. Welcome back to another week of the principal's office. And we're back with our special guest, Dr. Michelle Foster. We're just continuing the conversation that went on and on last week. And for good reasons, because we're talking about black teachers, where did all the black teachers go? But in our conversation, we've been in so many different arenas dealing with the education of our children that we want to pick up where we left off. And so one of the things that Dr. Foster mentioned the last time that we were together um, was that there's a disenchantment on behalf of many black families today with the educational system. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Well, you know, we, nobody believed more in education and schooling than black people. What most people don't realize is that it's black people after the Civil War that were responsible for a lot of the public school systems being. You know, people forget that's what Reconstruction was about. Mm -hmm. And it's before that, poor white people didn't have schools either. So that's it. So we were like the drivers of schooling and education. And I think what's happened over time is as much faith as we've had. They always said that after the Civil War, every black person that could go was going to get to learn to read. Old people, young people, mm -hmm. people in their 60s and 70s. But something has happened. And then it, even through the 50s and 60s, we were, who believed in education more than black people? I tell people, I said, if you were willing to send your little girl like Ruby Bridges through a screaming mob to go get school, and you can't tell me you didn't believe in education, no white parents would have sent their little six-year-old no. through that. So that's evidence that we believe in it, right? But it's been constantly telling us we're not worthy. We're not smart enough. As I said, we send our smart kids to school, and we know they're smart. Little boys, they're bright. They can talk and everything. And then they become the difficult kids. They okay, but wait a minute. Let me stop you there, because uh -huh. that goes back to the conversation we had about integration. I mm -hmm. think you're spot on. There has been a desire to, to continue to learn and to grow as, as a people. But when integration came and we started going into white schools, we were told that we weren't good enough, that something was wrong mm -hmm. with us, that we were inferior. That's right. So why do we keep? Why, why is that so important now? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think if you look at the history of desegregation, you will find that lots of black teachers and principals, and there's books about this, their highest potential is a good book. It won the Grommaya several years ago. Mm -hmm. Those people who had been from the 30s had pushed to have good schools, have better buildings, they, they were worried about what was going to happen to the kids. But remember, some of the big people that were in charge of, told the teachers, you're just trying to look out for your own interests. You're worried about your jobs. And people made a decision that we had to go forward even though, I mean, there are some people who said that even if it means all the black teachers lose their jobs, it wasn't that they weren't unaware mm. of it, that's going to be worth the price to pay. I think what people are realizing now is that the, the teachers and the principals couldn't believe that the kids would go and be well received, that they would see the, the, that they were bright, that they would see that they were smart. So I think that's what's come to be. And the other thing is, remember, the desegregation wasn't really done E on an equal basis. It wasn't like two, two, two things two, were coming yeah. together strong. One said, you're the weak person, so you've got to give up everything, and you're coming to us, and we've got everything. So from the very beginning, it meant that we were the weak link. And it, it's, it was hard to imagine that anything we had to offer would be heard. There's a very interesting book that Vanessa Siddle Walker called, called The Education of Horace Tate. And it traces the history of the uh, American, the Association of, of uh, Black Teachers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Association of Black Teachers in uh, Georgia. And it shows how the Black Teachers Association was desperately trying to become a bigger voice in the NEA. They were trying to take what they knew about teaching African American kids and make it front and center in that. But it's about how they lost, right? Because 
we were, it, it, was, it was hard for the larger group to see that we had something to contribute. So there's a huge history now that shows that black teachers really were and organizations were trying to insert themselves. Because they had, you know, the, what people don't realize is that the teach, black teachers, and this is in the article I wrote, were not just a set of people that weren't connected. The historically black co colleges were connected to the black teachers associations. They were connected. So everything was about how can we educate our children. And so it was like a kind of a, a circle of care. Mm -hmm. Universities, uh, uh, black uh, teacher ed people, um, schools, mm -hmm. they would meet and strategize and talk about it. So it was all about what do we need to do for this, these black kids to, to teach them what they need to know. Well, when the desegregation came, all that collapsed. And you know that, you know, I was, some historically black colleges in the 80s and 90s had little tiny teacher ed programs when they used to have huge ones. Mm -hmm. That used to be what historically black colleges did. But if you're not, if the teachers can't get jobs, and then all the t kids who couldn't go to white schools now going, then all of that collapsed. So there was an infrastructure of education and schooling beyond just the teachers. They didn't exist in a vacuum, mm -hmm. right? And so then they also had relationships with the parents. Mm -hmm. So you had a kind of a, a stronger link between the parents, the school, the pr everybody. And the other thing is, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure you must know this, that, you know, the, the parents were, the, 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 pa the teachers were encouraged to visit the parents. They were more likely to see them in the grocery store. Okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> you have to argue then the point of why integrated schools. Well, again, I, you know, I, I think that unless integrated schools are really going to change their number, and I haven't seen any evidence that they will. I mean, I think certain African American kids can do well in integrated schools. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. And I think those are the same ones that have always done, done well. Those well. 30%. Right, yeah. that they can do well in the schools. But the question is, what about all the other kids that don't do well, that are not well received, that are seen as uh, deficient in some way, or their parents don't care about them? So that's the bulk of the kids that I think we're worried about, mm -hmm. right? So and what happens if those kids are in segregated schools? What do, well, the what do we fear? The segregated schools have to also step up, right? So you've got to have a group of teachers in those schools who believe in the kids. You know, you're going to recreate what you had in the 50s. You've got to have the whole thing. So if you have teachers who also don't think the kids are capable or see them as, you know, deficient in some way, that's not going to work either. Mm -hmm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? You've mm -hmm. you got to have all of those things. And then you've certainly got to have resources. Right, you've got to have the the the, um, the supports for the kids and the things they need. You also have to have a way of seeing those kids as in need of help and support, not punishment. Okay, so does it go both ways? So I was recently watching um, uh, the Great Return to Tulsa. Maybe I can't uh -huh, remember uh -huh. the name of it, and they talked about how. Um, for them, uh, they were on one side of the railroad track, but ultimately some of the young people always found themselves going on the other side, always found mm -hmm. themselves wanting to integrate and to be a part of their community, which actually led to the bombing of, of Tulsa. But I think about it in terms of education and I say, okay, um, there's 30% of us that will do well over here. Right. But 70% of us won't. So if I'm on this side of the track, what do I need to make sure happens over here? Because I can't even guarantee resources mm -hmm. because resources are coming from that side. So I can't guarantee that they're going to get here. But how can I guarantee that the adults in those schools are what you describe? Those caring adults who are passionate about their belief that all children can learn in those schools. Well, I mean, I think one thing is that the principal would have to have some say over who comes to her school right you would have to be able to select mm. those teachers that you think can do the job now i don't know how the teachers are placed today mm -hmm. in schools but that would be the requirement of the principal to really have a way to assess and then to work with those teachers to get them to become the teacher she needs them to be mm. does that make sense and mm -hmm. so that i think is important because you know working with the teachers to help them see what they're doing what they're not doing what they need to do that's what you'd have to do because basically it's the development of the teacher core
that is going to make the difference in terms of what happens. So if I'm at a segregated school as the principal and I'm employing teachers, the teachers that are applying for that segregated school want to be there. Mm -hmm. And so doesn't that necessarily follow the train of thought that they're because they are they want to be there they will do a better job in teaching the students that are there well that that's the necessary but insufficient <laughs> condition <laughs> i mean you have to want to do a better job and then you have to learn to do, do the better, better job. job those are two different things i mean i have a lot of graduate students they want to do but they may not realize what this will work entails skill, right you know you <laughs> need the will but then you need the skills too mm -hmm. and so accepting that will is not enough that wanting to is not enough, and you have to develop, you have to get feedback, you have to improve. I mean, that's what everybody has to do. So that's, I think, will is not enough. Mm. That's necessary but insufficient. And then the development of skills, and the continuous development of skills. You can always get better at something. I mean, mm. you get better at something your whole career. I'm better at teaching than I was when I first started it. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the thing that's got to happen. And then the principal has to be able to figure out what kind of professional development do my people need. I know the school system. And I know the school system is bringing in the professional development they want. Uh, most of the teachers complain about it. So what kind of professional development do you, does, the, does that principal need her students need? Mm -hmm. I mean, her teachers need. I think that's what's important. But that would require the district at least giving some control over to the principal to know what she what her teachers need and and as far as i could see you know i would see go to the schools and they were the district had decided you needed x so the things i was doing with you which you might thought you thought it might have been useful that went out the window while you did x but mm -hmm. you know you hire a principal who knows her kids and who knows the teachers and so that's a problem as long as the district has the say over what people are going to be developed into or developed on, that's a problem. That reminds me of a book you shared with me years ago about beyond test scores that looked at what mm -hmm. quality schools were mm -hmm. and what they, talk a little bit about that. I mean, that was a great book. It was one of the Grawmeyer selections. It didn't mm -hmm. win, but it's re it was really d done by a man, and not necessarily for African-American schools, but right. a man who realized that some schools are bringing, you know, he was upset about the fact that they have those great schools and they, uh, the, the, the real estate follows that school. Right. And he was saying, if you have a group of kids who come in, all in the, the privileged kids whose parents take taken place and everything, well, the school's not adding value to those kids. But you need to look at these kids at the school. And he said, you would never see it in the test scores. Because these, and so that was a set of ways to look at what are some of the other ways we can measure the, the, the growth in the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we could ask them questions. I mean, even to my way of thinking, even when the school district had portfolios, that was a I, I understand that JCBS used to have portfolios, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you know, but, but portfolios are expensive. I mean, the reason you have testing is it's cheap. That's why you have standardized testing. Let's be honest. <laughs> it costs 50 cents a person. That's cheap. Right? right. And so portfolios are a much better way to assess growth. Right. Not only that, but then the parents can see that. If I'm a parent, you know, I was in one school in, in California where the teacher would have the kids read. So, so the first week they'd read, and then she'd have them read once a month. So that became part of the portfolio because she said the parents could listen mm -hmm. to the kids read. And, and she would say, you hear this child reading? That's the way your child should sound. So that's a kind of a marker mm -hmm. of progress, right? That you're never going to capture in a standardized test score, because that's a that's a that's a that's a one-time thing. If you're sick that day or whatever, it's not. So right. I mean, portfolios where you can see growth. Okay, children who are writing in the second grade and how that writing develops. That's really what I would want to see. I think that's the intent of the JCPS backpacks. Okay. All right. So I think the intent is to show growth over time. I'm able to display for you what makes me qualified to move on mm -hmm. to the next stage of life. And it's a, re it's a replacement, supposedly, for ACT, SAT. But we talked about standardized tests and how they were developed and how they are not a good predictor of performance. But one of the other things that we've kind of talked about before is recently there's been some debate about teaching black history in schools. Um, there's been debate about the 1619 project versus the 1776 project. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, 
1619 Project is, was done by a woman at the New York Times mm -hmm. who won a MacArthur re recently for that, along with that. And that curriculum was now being offered up to schools. Um, there are a number of states. I think Arkansas is one of them. Kentucky's not one of them so far. So that's, you know. So far. So far. We don't know what's <laughs> happening. You know, but right. Arkansas is one. And they want to outlaw this curriculum. And the idea is that they have decided that if you teach the truth mm -hmm. about what happened during when people were enslaved, that it will cause the black folks to lose their minds and hate white people. <laughs> They're going to hate white people, okay? So um, there's been a lot of resistance. Now, what's interesting is that if you go back to 2010, in Arizona, they had an ethnic studies curriculum for Latino students. Mm -hmm. And a man who was on the board of education passed, tried to get a law passed to prohibit the teaching of this curriculum, right? Now, this is Mexican-American mm -hmm. kids. This is not black kids. It's, right. not, it's yeah. not that many black people in Arizona. So, <laughs> okay. All right. And so the first, it went to court. The first judge upheld it, and the second judge turned it over. And he said in his ruling, this is discriminating against Mexican people, Mexicans. And then what happened was he said that this curriculum actually was good for kids because it made them feel better about themselves and do better in school. And then recently, San Francisco, I'd say in the past three or four or five years, has been teaching an ethnic studies curriculum in some of the high schools to ninth graders. And recently, a study was done that showed that kids who were at risk of failing actually did better from the curriculum. Because? So, because it, you know, if, listen, you know, I, um, W.E.B. Du Bois talked, we talked about integration. And in, not, in the 30s, around the time that we were fighting for desegregation, he said, there's nothing magic. He said, you may think an integrated school is a preference. He called them mixed schools. He didn't even call them integrated. A mixed school. He said, but a mixed school with no truth about the ne where the Negro is concerned, no truth telling about the Negro, where you use children as a doormat to be disrespected is not preferable to a, a segregated school where there's um, uh, sympathy, mm -hmm. uh, exp you know, uh, b belief in the kid. He says that. And I think it's 1935. He said, it says, it's called, Does the Negro Need Separate Schools? Mm. If you haven't read it, you got to read it because it's very yeah. interesting. He says, that's really my point. You know, it's about the integration. There's nothing wrong with integration. He say integration is wonderful. But if you're going to not tell the truth about who we are, and you're not going to tell the truth about who you are, Okay, now that's important. <laughs> okay, let's someone see. once said that I I want to say it was I can't remember who famous person, um, but it was somebody who said, if if you you can't say who I am because you because it reflects on who you are. Uh -huh. You know, if you can't Don't. tell the truth about me, then it reflects on you. Mm -hmm. And so that is the that's kind of the the ideal. You know, it's an it's a mixed society, and that's the ideal. But not if you're going to not tell the truth or teach the truth about black people. If you're going to treat the kids as doormats to be kicked and mistreated, no. And so that, to me, is the thing. What is going to happen in these integrated schools? Are you going to teach the truth about black folks? Mm. Are you going to teach the truth about what you did to us? You know, now black folks, listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> black folks ain't going to get up and start being mad at white people. That's, you know, I mean, I think part of the reason white folks think we're going to be mad is because they know if they had been treated like that, they'd be mad. They'd be trying to get revenge. Revenge. That's, rather you know, than, yeah. But that's not what's going to happen. And so I think that to me has always been, you know, there's no magic in mixed schools if all those things aren't present. And I think that is, everybody should read that. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Mm -hmm. You know, we will put it on a link someplace mm -hmm. because that does is, the Negro need separate schools? Does the Negro need, by W.E. Du Bois, 1935. And he says it all. He says then what the black teacher had was a sympathy. When he says a sympathy of feeling, what he's meaning is that those black teachers could understand the plight of the kids. They could understand what it was like mm -hmm. not to be well thought of. And a lot of other things. They could understand the culture. They could understand the, you know, the way in which their parents and grandparents talk to them. I mean, that's what it means to have certain kind of sympathy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things if you grow up as a black person that, you know, people would always say to me, oh, are you saying um, that black people have some special way to teach mm -hmm. black kids? I said, it's not. I said, it's cultural. It's sociological. Look, I've been a black person my whole life. That's what I told you. I said, I've been a black person my whole life. That's what I tell them. So I know something about being a black person. 
I haven't been a man, so I don't understand men as much as I understand women because I've been a woman. That's a social position. Mm -hmm. If you've, even if you've been a black adult, you were once a black kid. So you, can un you, have, you start out being able to understand black kids better than someone else. Mm -hmm. And if you can empathize with them, if you can... Uh, but kids are kids. <laughs> but kids are kids. I'm colorblind. I don't see... Kids have <laughs> different experiences. They do, mm -hmm. right? They are kids. I mean, developmentally, they're all kids. But let's be honest. One of the things we have to understand that I think anthropology helps you understand is that human beings are developmentally the same in terms of the, okay. But what culture does, it, it inserts itself. So the experience is shaped differently. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people is culture is all the different ways of being human. That's what mm -hmm. culture is giving you. Right, mm -hmm. and so it's not that you're not human, and culture is an advantage of all the different ways to be human. There's all kind of ways to be human, right? And that's what culture represents. So that has to do with who you think is in your family and how you treat adults, and who's your auntie and not your auntie. Those are different kinds of mm -hmm. things, right? Who's a play cousin, and how you interact with adults, and how you even understand what adults are telling you when they tell you a certain thing. I mean, I would used to come to your school, and you know, I would come in and read a book, and then I would come back a month later, and the kids would see me, and they'd pull. I know you. <laughs> I say you do, and I was pretend I didn't know them. You do. How do you know me? You came and read a story in my class, and I would always be surprised that they would remember me. Mm -hmm. But I think, and they would always say to me when I'd come in, I'd sit and I'd say, "Are you somebody's mother?" <laughs> Uh, who's Because that was their experience. Yes. That's right. Because if I was sitting in there watching, I had to be somebody's <laughs> grandmother, right? They knew I wasn't anybody's mother. I was too old. You, who, because they wanted to identify me with somebody they could relate to. Mm -hmm. I knew that. I mean, I knew that. Mm -hmm. They were trying to make a connection with me. Period. End yeah. of story, right? Yeah. So that, you know, I understand that that's kind of how the kids are. They'd see this person coming in. She'd be walking. They want to make a connection with you. And if you can't understand that, then you can't teach the kids. You know, they're desperate to make a connection with you. They're desperate to understand more about you. They're desperate to know what you think. You know, let's be honest. I said, one of the things about the African-American community is there's a lot of characters in the African-American community. <laughs> so the kids, that's what we, that's what we are, yeah. characters, right? Yes. And so the kids from a very young age learn to see the different characters. Right, they're like all kinds of good characters. And so they're very open to, you can be almost any character you want. They can like you. But I don't think if you understand that about the kids, then you can't even figure out how you interact with those kids, right? Mm. I mean, when I would see the kids, I'd say, oh, your hair looks so nice. Because I know they want that connection with me. Look, they want to think they know me and have a connection. And if they do, they'll do anything Thing for, me, for you. Including learn. Yes. It's really about that connection. Mm -hmm. And it's not a fake connection. I mean, they want to feel like you're a genuine person. So that even if you're angry, that's OK. But at least they know it's, it's a real, right? And I don't, people say, well, we have to have a relationship but never get mad. No, you can be mad. Yeah, I mean, some of the people you love the most, you're mad with. <laughs> you know, you're yes. not always happy with them. So I think that's this idea of really, but you have to like the kids, think that there's something worth knowing about them, try and figure out what they're good at, appreciate their verve. I mm -hmm. mean, the kids are like jumping around and dancing around. So what can I do with that? So talk to that. me about language, because uh -huh. today, and we've had this conversation before about how things have just been pre repackaged and so differently. <laughs> so, you know, multicultural education, um, we're talking about abolitionist teaching, we're talking mm -hmm. about culturally responsive teaching, we're talking about, you know, even diversity, equity, and inclusion, all mm -hmm. of these titles, all of these words, but what are we really talking about when it comes to the education of children? You talk so much about culture, you talk so much about experiences, and you talk so much about integration and its role. So what do we need to focus the conversation around? Because I think that those words naturally apply to this time that we're in now and black children. But when we're talking about children and the things that you've talked about, which go for any group of young people, mm -hmm. How do we classify that? How do we need to talk about that? Do we need these labels? Well, I mean, I think that part of the problem, you know, I teach at the university, so one of the things I notice is how these labels are constantly shifting. 
So now we're talking about critical race theory or talking about culture, you know. And I think it, 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 there's these labels and they're new. We put, we put them on them. But this could be like old wine in new bottles. I mean, I am sure that some of the teachers who taught in the 50s and 60s were doing culturally responsive teaching. Yeah. Right? Because they were understanding their kids and what those particular kids need based on what they knew about them culturally. Right. Right? But I think the problem I see is we have these labels and we don't even know what's behind them. So the big label in every school district now is culture, CRT, culture responsive, responsive teaching. teaching. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Okay. And every place I go, when I first got here, I'd say, well, what would you do with this problem? And the student teacher would say, CRP, CRT. <laughs> Culture. I said, so if I came to your classroom, what would I see? They couldn't tell me what would I see because culture responsive teaching is not just a thing. It's, it's something I would see, and they couldn't talk about that. So I think part of the problem is the labels often substitute for the real understanding of the thing that it is we're going to do. So, for example, you know, we say that African-American kids don't have any language because Hart and Risley said they hear 30 million words million less. Million words less, yeah. Well, I mean, come on, the kids can do rap, they can do songs, they can do stories. They have language. Mm -hmm. So w if I know that, what would I do to build a curriculum around teaching them to read? Or how would I tap into that? If I know they like to move around and sing and dance, how would I tap into that? But the important thing is how would I tap in that not just so that it's fun for them to do, that's nice, but how would I tap into that so it ties itself to some learning thing I want them to do? Well, and, and in our last few minutes, I want you to kind of expound upon that because you developed a tool mm -hmm. that um, does that, is yep. the action behind culturally responsive teaching. And what is that? It's called the HIT CRIT, <laughs> the, hit the heuristic crit. for teaching about um, culturally responsive teaching. And I should tell the story about, I, you know, I, I was developing it for the course in African-American English I have. And when I went to bring it to the class, somebody in the class said, oh, this would be good for culturally relevant, relevant teachers. And I never turned down a good idea. If you've got a good <laughs> idea, I'm running with the idea, right? All ideas are good. And so we developed this tool. And it really was designed to help put into action for the teachers this thing called culture so that they could plan these lessons around that. Now, I hate to say that the University of Louisville has not been that interested in my tool. <laughs> But people in San Antonio have run with it. So I got someone in San Antonio, and they're running and using it. Because it's, a de it's designed, really, to help the teachers think about the culture and the style and the text and the identities and to consider all those things as they plan a mm. lesson. So you don't plan a lesson with the, the, skill, the, the instructional skill. standard. Right. 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 What you do Alone. Is, right. You say, who am I teaching? And what might be the things that in the text that interest them. And when tech, when you say text, you're not just talking about the textbook. I'm just not talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking not, about. Yeah. Hey, I'm not talking <laughs> about the textbook. I'm not talking about the written print. Mm -hmm. I could be talking about the anything that gives meaning is a text. Mm -hmm. I could be talking about the way people dress. That's a text. Mm -hmm. I could be talking about the way a building is arranged. That's a, a text really in the knower sense is anything that gives you meaning, mm -hmm. right, without focusing on the details. So that could be that. It could be a, a YouTube. It could be a TV show. Mm -hmm. It could be um, anything that kids, me a meme. I mean, those are all texts. Yes. So I'm talking about that, and then I'm talking about the style. How would these kids in their communities behave around this text? What would they do? How would they arrange themselves? How would they talk? And I think when I brought the woman, I don't know if she talked about it in your class, but when I brought Terry Meyer to your mm -hmm. class, one of the things she talked about, as an example, she talked about the fact that when you're in school, there's a certain kind of discussion. You have to raise your hand. Right. Exactly. Right. You're, raise your hand and give the answer. And she said, but that's not the way black folks, black folks jump in for the conversation. <laughs> and she said, you could teach both kinds, the raise your hand kind and the jump in kind. Now you're not saying one is better. Right. And so that's a good example of a style thing, mm. understanding that that's a kind of a way that people in the community might act or maybe that they tell stories. You know, tall tales. And my grandma used to say lies. My grandma used to tell these big <laughs> lies. Lies. He was lying. Right? And the humor in that. Mm -hmm. So those are, those, are, those are stylistic things. How kids interact with each other. How, you know, adults and kids. That's the style piece. And then the identities is how is this style and this text fit into this kid's historical, social, mm -hmm. and cultural identity? And my point is if you can get all those things together and then tie it to the 
outcome, the thing, the, the thing you learn, yes. bingo. It's, that's what we call the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Because that's, in, that's pulling on all of the kids' identities and interests and ways of being. So we developed that, hoping that that would help teachers and also principals help them begin to have a different conversation than they were having. All right, so if you've been listening, you know that we need a different conversation in our school systems, and you also know that Dr. Michelle Foster can help us understand that. Now, one of the ways you can get in contact with Dr. Foster is through her email. Right. She is at the University of Louisville. I think it's Michelle Foster Michelle or Michelle Dot Foster. Foster at louisville.edu. All right, there you go. I'm Michelle Penix, Principal Penix to most. It has been healing for me. I hope it's been the same for you, especially if you care about our children and our community. Remember, we're here every week, same time, same place. We want you to keep coming back, keep informing yourself about the things that are happening in our community in the area of education so that you too can be a part of the change. As always, thank you for being a great um, visitor with us, a great audience participator. Thank you to our guest, Dr. Thank Michelle you. Foster. The conversation will always continue. And as always, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm.